Hey everyone, thanks for your time as always. With the media events surrounding transportation of the Artemis II SLS core stage planned to begin next week, updates will probably be a little shorter, but hopefully also a little more frequent, given the potential for some almost live news. NASA is continuing final pre-ship preparations for that transport of the core stage from New Orleans to the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, and imagery is being published a little bit at a time this week. But there was also a couple of other Artemis II notes over the past couple of weeks and a short gateway update with a new picture. In this video, I'll run through those news items and also circle back to the big picture. On July 3rd, NASA announced astronaut Andre Douglas as the NASA backup crew member for Artemis II. He will train with the four-person flight crew to be ready to fly on the mission in the hypothetical that one of the three NASA astronauts, Reed Weissman, Victor Glover, or Christina Koch, could not fly. Last November, the Canadian Space Agency announced that Jenny Gibbons was the backup crew member for Jeremy Hansen. Backup crew members would help to mitigate the impact of a long-term absence from one of the primary crew, which is something that has occurred on occasion, but is still quite rare. And it's less likely that we would see a situation like the Apollo 13 case, where Ken Mattingly was replaced by Jack Swikert less than a week before launch because Mattingly could get sick during the mission. Prior to Apollo 9, all three primary crew members had colds, and in that case, the launch was delayed a few days. A similar situation occurred right before STS-36 in 1990, and the mission was delayed by a few days. Both of those were Earth orbit missions, though, and not, and not driven by a lunar or planetary window. NASA published two shots of the Artemis II Orion spacecraft being lowered into the altitude chamber on June 28th, and I went over that to some extent, in a previous video. In the blog post on that day, it was mentioned that testing was expected to take about a week, but Public Affairs noted in a follow-up email that the plan was for Orion to be in the chamber for one to two weeks, including test preparations and post-test work. So if all goes well in the vacuum testing in the chamber, we may see the spacecraft move back to the fast cell pretty soon. Whenever that is, Public Affairs said another blog post will be published. On July 5th, NASA Public Affairs posted a social media update on the Gateway Halo module with a new picture. The Halo, which stands for Habitation and Logistics Outpost, is still at Tazi in Turin, Italy. And this new picture shows the welded barrel and some secondary structures with testing equipment attached to the ends of the barrel. The social media post notes that static load testing is underway and notes, for the first time in public anyway, the proof pressure test that will also need to be completed before the structure is ready to ship to the Phoenix area here in the U.S. for systems installation and outfitting. A couple more updated renders of the SLS Block 1B vehicle were spotted during the July 4th holiday week. NASA has started to update its public graphics to reflect the flight configuration of the exploration upper stage on Block 1B. As noted in a video from a few weeks ago, much of the exterior of the stage will be painted white. As with other relatively long duration in space stages, the white paint is added for thermal and space charging reasons. We see the same thing with the initial SLS in space stage, the Interim Cryogenic Propulsion Stage, or the ICPS. So these renders have been updated to reflect that the LH2 tank barrel and the two adapters that help connect the stage above and below are painted white. There are still many more renders that will need to eventually be updated. Late in the afternoon on Monday, July 8th, NASA basically announced that Core Stage 2 had moved from final assembly at the Michoud Assembly Facility to the Vertical Assembly Building there on July 6th. The stage was moved at sunrise that morning, which signaled completion of final exterior work and other tasks like weight and center of gravity measurements. The stage was moved with Boeing's factory tooling and SPMTs, or self-propelled modular transporters. The stage remains secured in two RATS, or Rotation, Assembly, and Transportation tools, as it has been since March of 2023. 
A time-lapse video was included in the release on Monday the 8th, showing how the rats can rotate the stage around one axis while it remains fixed in the other axes. Much of that work in the time-lapse video was performed in June, and it covers the early part of the final exterior work, although the actual TPS applications themselves are not shown. After a cut in the video, we see that the base heat shield face of the bow tail has been given a more complete coat of white paint over the insulating cork. And after the curtain is pulled back, we see that spray-on foam insulation has been applied to arcs of a couple of the bolted flanges. In the picture from July 6th included with the announcement, we can see the beginning of the move out of Area 4748 in Building 103. The SPMTs eventually moved the stage to Building 110, also known as the Vertical Assembly Building, or Michoud's VAB. The stage went into the transfer aisle, where it will be lifted out of the rats by the two heavy cranes in there. The factory tooling and SPMTs will then be removed, and the NASA Overland Transportation tooling and SPMTs will be used. The Overland Transportation Tooling is enigmatically called the Multipurpose Transportation System, or MPTS. Over the course of final assembly, multiple rats were attached to different sub-assemblies of the stage, but at the end we see in the July 6 picture that there was one rat attached to the forward or upper flange of the forward skirt, and another secured to the outside of the engine section where the thrust structure is bolted inside and where eventually the aft attachments of the solid rocket boosters will be bolted. Those two rats are exchanged for hardware interface structures, or hisses, that attach to the stage and to multipurpose carriers, or MPCs. The forward hiss attaches to the forward SRB attach points on either end of the inner tank, and the aft or common hiss attaches to brackets at the same ring on the engine section that the rat was attached. The Overland SPMTs will pick up the whole thing by the MPCs and move it at MAF out to the barge. Then, after the Pegasus barge arrives at the Kennedy Space Center turn basin dock, the SPMTs will eventually pick up the MPCs again and roll the stage off the barge and into the more famous VAB at Kennedy Space Center. Before the rollout at MAF, a weather cover will also be attached on the front end of the stage at that forward or upper flange of the forward skirt. Portable purge units will be hooked up to the stage before and after the moves to keep the equipment in the inner tank, the engine section, and the RS-25 engines dry. Taking a look at the big picture for Artemis 2 and 3, the Artemis programs from Starship to SLS are still quiet about schedules, but the calendar isn't slowing down. For Artemis 2, most of the flight and ground hardware is essentially ready for stacking. What's still outstanding is Mobile Launcher 1 out at Pad 39B, the SLS core stage that is about to be barged to KSC, and Orion. After the core stage arrives at KSC, the last two pieces of flight hardware that need to be shipped to Florida are the two connecting adapters that are at the Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville. The September 2025 target to be ready to launch is a little over a year away now. In terms of status, we're still waiting for an update from NASA about whether vacuum testing was completed on Orion since the spacecraft was moved into the altitude chamber a little less than two weeks ago now. After that, the question will be about the path to EGS handover. The Orion program was working fixes to digital motor controller circuits and batteries, so the question there is what's left to install. And then the bigger question we're waiting for an update on is about the status of the Orion heat shield investigation. But there's also some SLS post-flight work coming out of Artemis 1 that we're waiting to hear about, whether that's still open work or is it now closed. All of those factors could weigh in the timing of when to start stacking the Artemis 2 vehicle. So that's another big picture question or watch item. For Artemis 3, since the calendar keeps moving, the question marks about the schedules are getting bigger. It's now five weeks since the fourth Starship flight test, with the next one maybe next month. But that prototype test flight again sounds like it will focus on reusability. For Artemis, the questions are about how many more Starship flight tests will it take for SpaceX to reach the critical demonstrations that NASA wants to see. 
The questions are for all the programs that need to be ready for the lunar landing mission, though. The last detailed status about the SLS and Orion builds for Artemis III were provided last year, so it's hard to say one program or another is in a better schedule position. As for the alternatives for a different Artemis III, some of which we've been kicking around in previous videos, there are more questions than clarity there, too. Even if some of these ideas are feasible in theory, a better question is whether any of them are feasible in practice, especially if the goal is to fly Artemis III about two years from now. Thanks for watching. Click on the like button if you found this video informative. I'm hoping I can put out the next video from New Orleans. We'll see how things work out with the plans to roll the core stage out at MAF next week.